Really? I think we should wait. There's no one here. Should we wait for a minute or two? We're going to give folks just a minute or two to filter in, although I come from a large Irish Catholic family, so even people coming in and eating while I'm speaking won't stop me. <laughs> so, but why don't we just give them a, another minute or two before, before we get started. I'll make certain I keep an eye on our time clock. Okay. All right, wonderful. Why don't I start by introducing myself and then our panelists for this discussion. I know we're nearing the end of Milk and Palooza, so some of you, <laughs> your brains might feel like they're about to explode, but we promise that this is going to be a really fun, lively session, and we're going to be certain to set aside enough time for any of you to jump into the conversation, have a question for us, argue, you name it, uh, so that you really feel like you get as much out of this dialogue as, as we all do. Um, I'm Cece Connolly. I'm the managing director of the Health Research Institute at PricewaterhouseCoopers. The easiest way to think about that is we are essentially a healthcare think tank within a consulting firm. Um, but prior to that, I was a journalist for 25 years. I wrote about politics and healthcare. And, um, I'm thrilled to be here with you today. Let me first introduce, and I'm going to try to do this in the, the correct order here, uh, to my far right on your left, Dr. Thomas Frieden. He, of course, is director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention uh, based in Atlanta. He also is the former health commissioner of New York City, um, generated a couple of fun headlines while he was there. And also, uh, this factoid I love about Dr. Frieden, he himself was an EIS officer at the CDC back uh, at the start of his medical career. And I have great admiration for the EIS Corps, so we're thrilled to have him here with us. Uh, next to me on my right is Jonathan Gluck, and he is the senior executive at Heritage Provider Network. And it's a very interesting organization that I think Jonathan will tell us a little bit more about it um, because they are, in essence, a, a payer, but also doing some very innovative things around using prizes to spur innovation in healthcare. And we'll hear a little bit more about that. So, Jonathan, we're thrilled to have you. On my left, immediate, Carol Roan Grayson's. Carol is now a professor of public health administration uh, at Georgetown University, and she continues, I believe, to have an affiliation with RAND, uh, where you were a researcher for many, many years. Carol specializes to some extent in looking at disparities in healthcare and also um, barriers to care, which we'll get into a little today. Next to Carol, down the line, Mike Harsh is the Vice President and Chief Technology Officer at GE Healthcare. And fun factoid about Mike, I don't know if anybody else on our panel can say this today, but he holds many patents. So um, I don't know if you brought any of them with you today. To, to I brought some toys. Good. <laughs> Excellent. Show and tell. Excellent. And at the far end, uh, last but not least, of course, Dr. Peter Margolis, who has many, many titles, which I can't possibly give you all of them, but he is a professor of pediatrics at the University of Cincinnati School of Medicine. He's also the director of a research center um, looking at health systems and um, is a big expert in big data. So we're going to ask him about big data today. So in essence, there's a big title for this panel, but in essence, the way that I think about this conversation for the next 50 minutes or so is examining what are the links, if any, between innovation in healthcare, medicine, science, broadly defined, and the economy, growth, uh, productivity, 
wealth of individuals or nations, et cetera. And so we're really going to try to examine what those links are or could potentially be in the future. And we're also going to try to debunk a couple of myths for you, because I think that's always important on a topic like this. So what we're going to do is start with, I think, a little bit of a, a simple opening question, but it should be good for setting the table and also giving you a chance to meet and understand a little bit more about each of our panelists. So I come from Washington, DC. And whenever the subject of healthcare comes up in Washington, the only thing that you hear is how expensive it is, how rapidly costs are rising, what a budget buster it is. Right? That is really the context for the discussion in Washington. But Faster Cures, the Milken Institute, and many of us up here think that there's a different way to have that conversation around healthcare and money. So let me start, and we'll just go right on down the panel for an opening. Let me start with each of you. Could you give me one of your best or favorite examples? Make the case for the link between healthcare innovation and the economy. Dr. Frieden. Well, one of the great examples is immunization. CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, works 24-7 to protect Americans from threats, whether they're infectious, environmental, or chronic, whether they come from this country or abroad. Immunizations, some of which were developed at CDC, some of which were developed at NIH, some of which were developed uh, in industry, pharmaceutical industry, are one of the great accomplishments of the last century. And if I could just show one slide, I think the third slide of mine, get a sense of the incredible return of, on investment that we've had from immunizations. For every dollar uh, we spend on immunization, we save $3 in the healthcare system and $10 in the economy in general. So there's a tremendous pay payoff, not only in terms of uh, the economy, but even more so in terms of lives saved. So this slide, which should be getting up right about now. Whoops, one back. Um, can we project that? We can see it fine. So basically, okay. we're looking at each year about 20 million cases of disease prevented, 42,000 lives saved. And ultimately, that's the test. Are we saving lives? Are we preventing illness and injury and death and disability? But there's also a huge financial payoff. Um, if you look at the cost, the ROI, the co benefit to cost ratio, it's three to one for direct medical costs and 10 to one for societal costs. So basically, we're putting $14 billion a year into the healthcare system and $70 billion a year into the economy. That sounds like a pretty good ROI for any investor in the room. Yes. Jonathan, got a great one for us? Yeah, and mine's actually going to be pretty simple. I think it is the push to an accountable care model of healthcare provision. And by accountable care, I really mean providing high quality, cost effective care against a budget. I don't care if you call it accountable care organizations, I don't care if you call it capitation, I don't care if you call it uh, medical homes or however you term it. Providing care against a budget requires keeping people healthy, providing preventive care, making sure that the right care is provided in the right time, at the right time in the right place, and it's the right care. And it's been proven to save, save money and provide healthier outcomes. It's what we've done at Heritage for 30 years. Um, Dr. Richard Merkin founded the company 30 years ago on the uh, premise that that was the right way to provide care. And we know it works. And so seeing that we are now moving, whether it's through the Accountable Care Act, whether it's through CMMI and CMS, moving towards the accountable care model, we know that that can be done. And everything we're doing, whether it is the prizes that we're sponsoring or the other advances we're trying to make, is really trying to show that the best way we can, as a society, save money, provide higher quality care to a larger segment of the population is through that accountable care model of care provision. Well, it's so interesting that you all have been following that model for 30 years because you're still the rarity in the U.S. health system today. I mean, we are still, by and large, $2.8 trillion spent this year on fee-for-service, which means we pay for people to do stuff to us, not to keep us well. Um, there is, of course, the concern that many articulate in this model that people will de be denied care, that innovation will be stifled. 
I think that for, if you think about how the model works, my best patient is a healthy patient. It is much more expensive in our system to try to provide care for someone after they've gotten sick than it is to try to keep them healthy up front. It's much more, just from a pure cost effectiveness basis, better for Heritage or for any organization to try to keep that population healthy, provide the preventive care so they don't get sick, then try to care for them afterward. And we know it works. We know what our outcomes are. We know how many days people spend in the hospital. Simple ways of measuring by providing that preventive care, we know that we can keep people healthy and we know that we can uh, save money uh, for the economy and do it by doing so. Great. Carol, opening thoughts. Yeah, so I, I'll follow on to that with also talking about some innovations that are designed to uh, bend the healthcare cost curve. So by that I mean trying to reduce the amount that we spend on healthcare while either maintaining or improving quality outcomes. Um, but before I talk about the innovations, I think it's worthwhile to just spend a minute, a minute to talk about healthcare costs and their effect on competitiveness, uh, which is one of the, the themes of this panel. And when we think about healthcare costs, 50% um, of people in the U.S. get their health insurance from an employer, and so employers bear a lot of the health care costs when we think about health care spending. And um, this may be a surprise, but economists disagree about the effect of health care costs on the competitiveness of U.S. firms. So economic theory tells us that when we look at an employee's total compensation, it's made up of wages and benefits, and to the extent that health care costs rise, um, employers could lower wages to make total compensation be the same. So economic theory suggests that maybe healthcare cost rising isn't such a big problem. But um, when we look at the empirical evidence, we find that actually um, it isn't always so easy to be able to lower wages in response to that um, increase in healthcare costs. And that could be because of union contracts, it could be because the minimum wage sets a floor on wages, or for a lot of other reasons. So research that came out of the Rand Corporation um, just a couple of years ago looked at industries that had a high percentage of firms that offer employer-sponsored health insurance and compared that to industries that had a, a lower probability of offering employer-sponsored health insurance. And what they found was that as healthcare costs were rising, the effect of those um, really did affect the output in terms of job creation and um, and other measures of, of output among the industries that were more likely or had more employer-sponsored <coughs> insurance. So that research suggests that, that really when we think about healthcare costs, it does affect the competitiveness of US firms. So the innovations that I think um, are really uh, important and exciting are some innovations that have been funded by the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, and this was part of the Affordable Care Act. And they've been piloting some different ways to try to bend that healthcare cost curve. One that I thought was um, interesting and exciting, both because it's uh, technology and it, and it seems to have a lot of promise, uh, was a company that was trying to work with low-income diabetics in Hawaii. And there are some real issues with um, accessibility of healthcare for those individuals in Hawaii, um, either because of transportation issues or other things. And this company is, is um, providing telehealth uh, support to low-income diabetics in Hawaii. And one of the really neat things they're doing is they're providing each person with um, what looks like a scale, but is actually a device that can take pictures of their feet. So for diabetics, a key problem is neuropathy. They lose sensation in their feet, and that can result in foot ulcers, and then ultimately in, in amputation. And so by taking pictures of the feet every day, and they get sent to a cloud, and they get looked at remotely, it offers a really neat opportunity to try to prevent poor outcomes related to diabetes. So that's one example, I think, of sort of an innovative delivery model that if we do better on the upfront up uh, trying to take care of diabetics, uh, we might spend less on healthcare. So Carol, I love the foot picture, yeah. um, but I bet one of the questions or one of the hurdles was who's going to pay for it, right? right. So, and, and this is what's so unique about the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, and that is that historically we haven't had payers who are willing to pay for this kind of, um, this kind of delivery of care. And this is a great example of, of the experimentation that's happening. This, uh, you know, I think the ACA really ushered in private public collaboration around new delivery system models, and Medicare is paying for this now in this pilot program. If things like this work, we could see it 
on a larger scale and more broadly available. That's great. Mike. Yes. You know, it's interesting for me. I've been in this field of medical imaging and instrumentation for I'm about going on 35 years now. And so when I first he started when he was 10. Yeah, <laughs> right out of college. And uh, it's fascinating for me because when I when I'd first started at GE, the CT scanners had just come out. And, uh, you know, I do remember some of the discussions we had with physicians back then. And, and they would make a statement like, well, you know, I'm never going to let a piece of skin get between myself and a diagnosis. And, and I thought about that. And if I've seen of all the innovations in these fabulous machines of what they've done today, I've had a part of digital x-ray, digital subtraction angiography. I've had a part of MRI, uh, the advent of positron emission tomography. And these machines do wonderful things. And, and, and they do cost money. And people say, well, the cost of those machines are quite high, and that's what's, what's really adding a lot to the cost in the healthcare system. What's interesting to me is I went back and, 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 and I've, I continue to look at this. You know, you don't hear about people having to have exploratory surgery today, like I remember when I started in this field. You just don't hear about it. And, and I thought about it, and I went back and started looking at numbers, and some of the numbers I've seen just in the last 20 years alone is exploratory surgery is down almost 60%. Um, and this curve was quite steep going into that, if I go all the way back into the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, and that in itself is squeezed out almost $14 billion in net savings into the healthcare system. Uh, so when I look at these fabulous machines and I look at the net impact they've had on, on people's lives and how much they save the healthcare system, I'm fairly proud of what we've been able to do. Now, there's still the appropriate use of these machines and we've got to continue to make sure that we um, educate people on that and, and they understand that you know you just can't do a CT scan for everything and uh, and so we've put a lot of effort lately into making sure that hospitals and institutions can really understand how to manage overall dose and what the appropriate use is of this technology. Did you bring something to show us? I did but I think when we come back around I'll, I'll let it turn on and we'll, okay. uh, we'll show it. All right he'll, he'll warm up his gadget well. Yes. Well, we turn to Dr. Margolis. Opening thoughts on, got a favorite example for us? Well, um, I, left I left practice because I was uh, interested in the challenge that uh, those of us who are physicians <coughs> face in not in confronting systems that really don't allow us to do what we want to do for our patients. Um, and what we found in our work is that the care that a patient gets is not just dependent on the, how good the doctor is or how much the doctor cares, but it's the system that the doctor works in. Pediatricians for many years have known that for kids who are facing chronic illnesses, we have to work together to have enough patients to uh, study and test new approaches to therapy. And we've built on that approach working with um, the American Board of Pediatrics to design a model that enables physicians to collaborate, uh, to work together, to standardize care, to agree on outcomes and to share information. And what we're observing now uh, in a number of large networks of physicians uh, is uh, really remarkable improvements in outcomes uh, for patients with no new medications uh, using the tools that they already have uh, to drive improvements. Um, and that results in better outcomes for patients, less, uh, and from a productivity perspective, less time off work for uh, families, uh, and uh, much better quality of life. I seem to recall a data point on rem remission rates. Yeah, so tell, tell the group a little bit more about that. Yeah, so um, if we can show the slide that's sure. right there. Sure, which, which sli is this the The very first one? slide. Um, one of the most advanced networks that we have is called the Improved Care Now Network. It's a network of uh, 52 uh, care centers looking after kids with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. This is uh, 15,000 patients, about 1,000 clinicians and their care teams um, who are working together. They've standardized care. And uh, since they began in, in uh, 2007, we've seen an increase in rates of remission from around 60% to 77%. That's without any new medications. I mean, in the context of no improvement in uh, outcomes for this disease in the last uh, 10 to 20 years. So no new medications, what is it that changed to have such a dramatic improvement? So these kinds of improvements result from patients uh, slipping through the cracks. Um, you know, one of the statistics that we uh, like to share is that 
the probability of a patient actually receiving the right care is only about 25 percent. There are studies in the New England Journal of Medicine that show that uh, adults and children in this country only receive about 50 percent of indicated care, and patients and families only choose to uh, participate in uh, prescribed regimens about 50 percent of the time. And so if you do the math, uh, since probabilities are multiplicative, 50% uh, times 50% is 25%. So, you know, we've done this work with the idea that, uh, you know, what would care, what would outcomes look like if uh, we got it right uh, 70, even 75% of the time. And so slipping through the cracks means uh, making sure that the dose of medication is adjusted for children as they grow and uh, that they don't outgrow their, their uh, medication dose and uh, uh, come out of remission. It means uh, working with adolescents so that uh, kids who don't want to be different from anyone else, how they have to work into their schedule taking 12 pills a day. And with physicians who are confronted with evidence from clinical trials, um, which is, provides average evidence, uh, but not evidence about uh, the best treatment for individual patients. Mm -hmm. Mike, is your gizmo warmed up? Oh, it's all set. Tell us what you have. I have to just share this with everyone. I had spent many years uh, designing ultrasound machines um, back in the 80s, and we knew then, once we made these digital, that they would continue to get small. Now, what's been helpful for us is when we look at, at that business in particular, it's probably one of the most global businesses we have, with design centers from, uh, from uh, Israel to Norway to China to Korea, uh, around the world, in the U.S., and so we were able to collaborate and, and, and pull this together because when you look at the needs for healthcare around the globe, things change. Uh, but by doing what we call reverse innovation and, and taking these innovations from around the world and then not just taking high-end technology down to the value, but taking the high technology you need for the small value products and bringing it up, you're able to produce these things. And this, this is just an awesome, this is like designed for maximum clinical utility. And if you're an engineer like me, a lot of fun. Um, you know, this is a real ultrasound machine, and uh, it, this thing is gorgeous. It does color flow. It does everything, and it's in the palm of your hand. I mean, it's... Uh, <laughs> that is light. It's pretty cool. Yes. So this is what I wanted to bring. That's amazing. Now, uh, just tell us, though, I mean, other than it being super cool for us, mm -hmm. um, what is the practical value of shrinking down that size to be so small and compact? You know, if you look at what a stethoscope should be, it, and, and you look at the definition, it's really to see inside the chest. Um, what we have here now is finally the 21st century, uh, century stethoscope. <laughs> we actually do have a device now that does allow you to see. Uh, we have gorgeous pictures of, uh, cardiac pictures of uh, blood flow around the, uh, uh, either either uh, vessels, uh, arteries, veins, uh, heart valves. Uh, this actually is what we want to be is, is what's at bedside. So we have point of care diagnostics. Wonderful, fun. Let me turn over here for a minute, Jonathan and, and Dr. Frieden. I think one of the interesting questions in healthcare is the notion of incentives. How do we um, encourage patients to behave differently? How do we encourage doctors to practice medicine differently? Um, what about those payers? What is their role? And um, I think I'm teeing up a little bit a conversation about prizes. And then also I want to hear from Dr. Frieden about more of the patient doctor. How do we incentivize? I, I think you said it very well. I mean, I like to think of um, healthcare as the ultimate behavioral economics problem. You know, we've got consumers who don't understand what they're purchasing and don't know what it costs. And then we've got providers who make more money the more that's provided. So no surprise, we, we are where we are. So how do we, how do we change that dynamic? And I think that what we're trying to do it, through innovation is using prizes to kind of in, change the incentives, certainly on the um, solution finding front. And I want to if I can, break it down into two parts. Number one, why prizes, and number two, why prizes in healthcare? Well, why prizes in general is, number one, crowdsourcing. We know that the crowd will come up with a better answer than an individual. Bill Joy, founder of Sun Microsystems, said it best. He said, no matter how many smart people work for you, most of the smart people work for somebody else. <laughs> and it's, it's very true. And then, second of all, we know that if for prizes that are 
formulated well, you will have approximately a 10 to 20 percent, a 10 to 20 times return, meaning the time and effort invested by the person pursuing the solution is going to be 10 and 20 times the, the amount of the prize. And then finally, prizes throughout history have fostered new industries, created world-changing ideas as simple as, you know, uh, Lindbergh's flight across the Atlantic was the result of a prize challenge. Uh, food preservation was the result of a prize challenge. And Napoleon needed to feed his army. They had to get food to the front lines. The French government created the 12,000 franc prize and the canning industry was born. More recently, you know, Virgin Galactic was the result, space travel for <coughs> individuals was the result of a prize challenge when people were able to come up with a ways to send individuals into space. So prizes throughout history have shown that they can change, change the world. So why prizes in healthcare? Well, I think from what we've heard on the stage today, healthcare is in dire need of, of change, of changed incentives. And we need to innovate in healthcare. We need to innovate ways to incentivize the provision of that primary preventive care that's going to make for healthier populations and lower costs for the community. And if I could just give you two examples of the prizes we're doing that really are aimed towards that. The first prize is one we announced two weeks ago with the Bipartisan Policy Center and the Advisory Board. And it's to actually crowdsource the question, not just the answer. We're asking the community to give us their toughest healthcare questions that can be solved through the use of data. We'll sponsor the prize, and then we'll have the data scientists solve the problem. So a perfect example of the kind of question we're getting asked is something we like to look, think of as bundles for babies. It's how do we incentivize and provide a bundled payment to the Medicaid providers in a state, here in the state of Virginia, so that we can give them a set sum of money so they're incentivized to provide the preventive care necessary in that population so that we don't have the complications from premature births, from NICU stays after, after birth. We have the data to find the answer to this. We just need to incentivize the solution. So it solves both problems. It solves the problem of providing the preventive care, and it incentivizes people to come up with the answer. And then finally, the Heritage Health Prize, which was the first prize we did, is asking data scientists to look at admission data for a population and figure out how do we predict who is going to be in the hospital in the succeeding year? The theory being that we spend as a society $40 billion a year on unnecessary hospital care. If we can predict who is unnecessarily going to go to the hospital, we can provide that preventive care that will hopefully be able to keep them from utilizing those services, keep them healthier, and keep them out of the hospital. And is that $40 billion figure admissions and readmissions? I don't know if it's, I've read it as admissions. I don't know if they're including in that figure readmissions. Uh -huh. um, it's services provided in the hospital. Not entirely sure how, it, how it's calculated. But in either event, if we know who's going to be there, we know what services could be provided to keep them out in a PCP's office. We could provide those services, save the country money, and keep the population healthier. Now, of course, the loser in that is the hospital. Well, I guess the only answer I would have to that is if we want to rein in our increasing healthcare costs, the money has to come from somewhere. In this example, it's the hospital, but at the end of the day, it's a fixed pie. Someone has to give up a piece of their slice of the pie. Okay, Dr. Frieden. I think I would take patients and physicians separately or providers separately. For providers, I'd really focus on information and incentives, ACOs, enormously important. But in the day-to-day, -day, information really is power. And we've seen practices dramatically improve just from finding out for the first time what their data really shows. So that your uh, inflammatory bowel disease example is exactly that. We've seen the same thing in high blood pressure. You know, there's a very simple question that you'll rarely see asked. What is the single thing that you could do in healthcare that would save the most lives? you'd be hard pressed to find much written on that. But actually, there's an answer, there's a right answer. It's control blood pressure better. In our society, only in the US, $2.8 trillion, we managed to control 47% of Americans with high blood pressure. And yet, high-performing systems get to 75, 80, even 
If you give doctors feedback on a monthly basis, they improve very rapidly. There's also a kind of information that an individual doctor or practice or hospital can't find out without public health being there. An outbreak, suddenly they're seeing more cases of a disease. Unless they're part of a community to provide that information to the community and get back what's happening, they can't take appropriate action. So I think for physicians, I wouldn't underestimate the power of information. Doctors want to do the right thing. If they're provided that information at the time of the encounter, they can. And if they're, if they're given that information in a kind of ranking, it's very motivating to improve. Interestingly, when we began providing public information on uh, hospital or provider behavior or performance, many people thought, patients would change their patterns where, where they would go. And it had very little impact on where patients went. It had a huge impact on provider behavior. Doctors don't want to be at the bottom of the list. For patients, I think the information is a little different. I think the incentives are a little different. And while information is very important, one of the crucial things is the default value. What is the easiest thing to do? And in our society, if we make the default value the healthy value, we're going to drive down health costs. We're going to in improve health status. It's great to be able to avoid avoidable hospitalizations because you take care of someone better when they're ill. It's great to be able to take care of someone for less money because you're more efficient in the healthcare system. But it's even greater if they don't need that care in the first place because they're healthier. And what we need to find are the modern day equivalents of fluoridated water, clean water, iodized salt, folate in the flour, things that make it really hard for people to do things that will lead them to get sick. And that, I think, is where public health comes in. We don't tell someone in a workplace, try not to breathe because there are cancer-causing chemicals in your air. We pass smoke-free air acts, or we ensure that all workplaces are smoke-free. So getting that default value healthy, I think, is the sweet spot for improving health and reducing costs. So several of you have started talking about data, information, the things that we can do with it. Um, probably not a week goes by that there isn't some headline about big data. And I'd love to get a candid assessment from some of you about in healthcare, are we really using big data? You've got a, one great example, Dr. Margolis. Um, but I have this sense that there's an awful lot of data in healthcare that's kind of trapped in silos right now, and we're not doing a great job of getting it to the physician to uh, motivate them to maybe do things a little bit differently to the consumer in certain instances. Let me start with Dr. Margolis and then some of the other folks. Well, I think we all, we all believe that there's a lot of uh, future in very rich data. One of the problems that we're facing now is, as you said, how do, how do we get access to it? We've been working on developing what we call a collaborative chronic care network in which all the participants in healthcare, the people, clinicians, patients, researchers, all work together to contribute data into uh, a system. And it, the idea is that the system will, it, it, the idea is to harness the inherent motivation that each of us has to uh, try and make a difference. So in our networks of physicians, uh, physicians actually pay to be part of the networks. They're so motivated to try and improve outcomes that they contribute uh, from their own practices. They see, uh, there's full data transparency in the networks. Each site can see the performance of all the other sites. Um, and there's uh, an expectation and, uh, that's produced in the group uh, that we share data transparently and that we have a sense of abundance about sharing data. What this has enabled us to do is to standardize the data elements that physicians collect at the point of care. And we're now working with vendors like GE and uh, uh, other large uh, electronic medical record vendors through some funding from the Agency for Healthcare Quality and Research to actually capture the data that's now standardized in the EMRs, upload it into a large registry, and then start to be able to reuse it um, to uh, address questions that we haven't been able to answer in pediatrics. An example is, uh, looking at the uh, relative effectiveness of one of the most commonly used drugs in Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, uh, it's called Remicade or uh, Humira, they're biologic agents, extremely expensive, $50,000 a year, um, and there's tremendous practice variation. There are no data, there have been no data uh, since the discovery of the agent uh, 19 years ago uh, comparing the effectiveness of these biologic agents against uh, routine 
uh, care. Uh, in the last year, we've been able to leverage data from about from the from the registry to actually do a, a what amounts to a simulated trial to get real world effectiveness of uh, to measure real world effectiveness and to start to give patients and uh, clinicians better information about the kinds of uh, outcomes they can expect from their patients. And we do this in a system which doesn't cost millions of dollars to set up for a clinical trial. It costs thousands of dollars, and it doesn't take years. It takes months. Um, so we're we're very encouraged by some of the some of what we're seeing, um, and it you know, gives us hope for the future that you know, if we can continue to leverage this kind of data that we can make a difference. Well, and certainly incredible economic <coughs> value when you start shortening that time period involved in getting to some of those answers because you know, we hear from uh, pharmaceutical companies, uh, the folks in the labs doing the developing that those years and years are so costly, not only just in terms of their investment, but the patients. Um, I heard a couple of S words from you that I think are probably worth underscoring. Standardization, critically important. Sharing of the information is another. Um, Mike or Carol, the potential of big data, where we are now, and what needs to happen? So I'll, I'll start. And say, you know, I think there's a real continuum when we think about electronic medical records or other forms of health information technology. And when we have siloed health information, there can still be real value. And so one example is I did work with some clinics in Montgomery County, Maryland, that serve the uninsured. And they implemented a very basic EMR that collected sociodemographic information and information about chronic conditions. And as Dr. Frieden mentioned, um, you know, this information can really help understand the needs of the population. And for the clinics in Montgomery County, Maryland, just looking at, I helped them to analyze this, you know, relatively simple data, but they understood that they had a far higher prevalence of mental health issues among their population that led them back to think about ways in which they could increase access to mental health care for their population. So even when health information is siloed, there's still that. Another way that even siloed health information can be helpful is for consumers. If they feel like they own that medical record, they might feel like they own their health more and that they can make choices about what providers to go to and not feel locked into providers. So along that continuum, though, if you keep going and if we have interoperability, if we have shared data system, if hospitals share data with ambulatory care centers, then there's this potential for reducing redundant care and really being uh, realizing some cost savings from that kind of, of thing. So I think we are probably far away from the interoperability and the shared data, and yet the progress that we've made on health IT, I think, has some real value already. I, I want to just uh, tap into that for one minute, and then, Mike, I'll go to you. But you know, just to give you a sense of the patchwork of our health system, which is really not much of a system. So I live in our nation's capital, right? One of the greatest nations on the planet. I have a good job. I have good health insurance. I go to some pretty <laughs> nice doctors in the district. I don't have an electronic medical record. And the doctors that I ask if they would please consider doing this tell me that they would sooner retire than go through that. Now, flip it around. I'm on the board of a place called Whitman Walker Health. It's largely an HIV AIDS community health center, 14th Street in the District of Columbia. Every single one of those patients has an electronic medical record. They get integrated, coordinated care. I asked the chief medical officer there, was it worth it to go through this? And he said, you know what? It was expensive to put this system in place. It was a big learning curve for all of their doctors, nurses, all of the clinicians, the staff that have to use it. And that kind of slowed them down for a period of time while they were figuring it out and implementing it. He said, though, absolutely positively now, he is confident that they are delivering better, higher quality care, that their safety has improved because of the use of these things. He opens up that record and boom, he's reminded of this patient's allergies. He's reminded that this patient didn't come in for a check of a viral load when they were scheduled to, or that now this woman should be getting a pap smear, et cetera, et cetera. He said that it has just been 
phenomenal tool for him and the rest of those teams. And they now have a great patient portal. And those patients log on, they schedule their appointments, they check their lab results, they send notes, they dig up information. It's really tale of two cities right in our nation's capital. Mm -hmm. just, just incredible. But Mike. I, I think that's fascinating in itself because it, it kind of underscores, I think, you know, we talk about our healthcare system. That would really truly move us to a healthcare system and away from a sick care system mm -hmm. that we have today. When, when patients really start to take control over, over their medical data and their well being. So that's really good to hear, but we have a ton of work to do. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I look at it, and uh, I, the terminology we've been using in GE is there has to be an industrialization of the healthcare system. Hmm. Um, that you know, might sound scary to some people. It, it could, but you know, if you think about it, I mean, I, some people spend more time worrying what auto mechanic to choose and how much they're going to mm -hmm. pay, and they don't seem to give that same attention to their physician and just what they paid for in terms of what was provided. And, and, and so if you just look at it, I wrote a couple of things down, but just removing the clinical and diagnostic variation alone, uh, that's what I mean by industrialization. There's clinical best practices that, if followed, really are predictive in terms of the results, and, and, and we have to get after that. You know, the other thing that just strikes me is just the way we talk about big data. Uh, you know, when you listen, just listen to the words. Someone says, well, we have this data vault. We've got privacy, we've got security. You know what, I want to liberate this stuff. I don't want to lock it up. I want to get after it. You know, what we've got right now is, I, I do believe that we are data rich and information poor uh, because we really don't have a way of getting after this. And we're starting to, we're starting to scratch the surface. And the numbers I just seen, um, when we look at, I'll say the industrialization of healthcare, every one point of variation of savings that we can drive out of the system is going to translate to 60 to 63 billion dollars of annual savings to healthcare. We can do a lot with that kind of money. Um, so that, that's what kind of excites me and in, in, in where we have to get after. Let me twist the question around a tiny bit um, to anyone. Can you have both? Can you reduce the healthcare cost trajectory and be innovating and saving lives and living longer, et cetera, et cetera. Can you actually do both, or are we going to have to accept a trade-off? I think, I think it's possible, but it's certainly possible the opposite will happen. Right? So one of the things that we need to do are, is to use big data and understand that what we need is not necessarily big data, but good data. And what we need necessarily is not good data, but good information for decision making, and then to use that going forward. But there are some astonishing innovations, and I did bring one to show. <laughs> So when I started as an EIS officer, Epidemic Intelligence Service officer in 1990, we did some of the first DNA fingerprinting of bacteria. We would identify a cluster of tuberculosis patients in that case. Uh, it took months. We sequenced a tiny part of the genome, and we had a rough sense of which patients were connected with which. And I did some of the first studies of these, and I spent literally months on it. Now, uh, we have a chip like this, and this chip can sequence a genome in three to four hours, not just of one organism, but of multiple organisms. But what it gives you is terabytes of information. And the ability to use that information, it's fortunate we have Moore's Law, because we would never be able to put this information together in a usable way. So I think the information revolution can help us drive down costs and drive up quality, prevent illness, prevent disease and death, but it won't necessarily do that unless we focus on it. Carol, you're the economist. Can I have it all? <laughs> I think the key question is over what time frame, right? So when we look <laughs> about at my lifetime, <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, I think uh, when we look at health IT, for example, so let's say people are getting their preventive care on a more regular basis, you know, those kinds of short-term increases in healthcare utilization can be more costly, but in the long run, if that helps us identify disease in an earlier stage and, you know, over the long run can reduce healthcare costs. So I think really this, there's a key question about over what time frame and do we have the patience to see if a lot of these innovations will result in healthcare savings over a long time period. You know, I guess the other key issue is do we have the time to be able to wait, right? We have um, really high and rising healthcare spending 
and the hope of some of the innovations that the Center for Medicaid and Medicare in, uh, Innovation is funding is that you know, by piloting and experimenting with different um, ways to bend the cost curve and increase value, maybe we can identify a few that will really work. And I think there's clearly no one size fits all that we have to experiment with lots of different ways of addressing um, healthcare costs and which populations we're talking about, whether it's people with chronic conditions or end of life care, but the experimentation um, is there and it's important and um, it holds promise, but who knows how much, I think. I can tell Jonathan wants to jump in. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd like to add to that if I could. Um, when we think about where healthcare data is, we have the data. I read some statistic to put it in simple to understand terms without using exabytes. It's, I guess we have enough healthcare data to fill 500,000 new libraries of Congress. That's a lot of data. It's not a data problem. And CMS and HHS and the insurers are all freeing up data to be used by researchers. But when you think about healthcare data and how it's used, we're in, it's, it's in its infancy. I mean, I think healthcare data is far less sophisticated than credit card companies. I mean, they know where to place the stamp on the envelope to get a better response from the consumer they're sending that envelope to. So what we really need to do is create that community of data scientists who appreciate working in healthcare and don't immediately go to look to work at Goldman Sachs and at Google, which is one of the things we tried to do with the Heritage Health Prize. And we actually had 39,000 entries into that contest. And most of the leaders are not involved in healthcare. They came from hedge funds, they came from all kinds of other industries and had no prior experience in healthcare. Now they understand claims data, they understand lab data, they understand pharmacy data. So it needs to be this effort by everyone involved to try to show what can be done through the use of data to improve, improve health, lower costs, and bring more people into the, solving the problems. Can I? Yes. Yeah, so one thing I gotta say, Growing up in this industry, I've watched the tremendous changes in the last five, six years in particular. And when we look at our product roadmaps and what we're going to develop, it has to pass three screens. Is it going to increase access to health care for the, for the world population? Um, is it going to improve the quality of the outcome or to the patient? And is it going to be affordable? And so we put those three screens on any new product that comes out. So I do think we can have it. It's just not the world as it was 30 years ago. If you build it, they will come. It, it, you really have to think through from, a, from an affordability, access, and quality standpoint just what it is that we're going to design. Well, and I would suggest that's an awfully wise and even somewhat forward-looking screen for a company like GE to be using because I think we certainly see in the pharmaceutical industry there are certain players with the Me Too medications that are probably going to get hurt as we move more and more into comparative effectiveness right. type conversations. Doctor. I just wanted to um, talk a little bit about, build on what Jonathan was talking about, the idea of crowdsourcing healthcare. We think that one of the most underutilized groups in healthcare are patients. And when you provide, when what we're working on in developing what we call this collaborative chronic care network is essentially a platform, a place where doctors and patients and researchers can all collaborate and work on uh, the, a common goal, which is improving health. And so as part of our networks, we now have patients involved in many, many different ways. They sit on the board. They participate, uh, they've participated in the design of the network. We have a Swedish intellectual property lawyer who found us uh, and is interested in developing mobile apps. We have uh, one of our collaborators is um, uh, Jesse Dillon, who's a filmmaker here in Hollywood, who's uh, very interested in communication. and. Uh, uh, talking about this uh, work. Um, we have an AIDS clinical trial doctor. We have parents who are pharmaceutical reps who are developing tools for new families. There's this enormous amount of energy that, uh, that people want to share and when they're given an opportunity to interact on a regular basis with uh, clinicians and their care teams, literally as part of the same team, um, they develop new ideas, and as part of the network, when something looks like it's working, we have a distribution channel that can immediately get it to thousands of patients. So very little cost in developing innovations and a way of uh, spreading it because there's a group of motivated people who are actually able to work together uh, in a way to make that happen. The six of us could probably just talk right on through lunch, but <laughs> mindful of the time and probably some growling stomachs out there, 
anybody have a question for our panelists, a comment, an observation? The lights are a little funky, but I see a, a hand right here, and I think we're bringing you a microphone. If you don't mind introducing yourself, that would be great. Um, yeah, what, um, what uh, Thomas Frieden said was uh, uh, very interesting to me, that, that really um, the default position for, for patients, for users, uh, being the, the, easiest, uh, the, the easiest way to go, it seems to me that, like iodized salt and some of the other examples you gave, that there's some very clear um, aspects, such, such as sugar in soft drinks, such as um, processed food, which is developed um, with uh, keeping, the, keeping the eater eating um, in mind. I mean, there was a, a wonderful article in, in the New York Times Magazine recently about really how much processed food is designed uh, to keep us eating, to keep us buying, not with health in mind or with nutrition in any way. There are some really obvious things that would be big improvements in, for the default position for, for you know, American citizens, for people around the world, I suppose. But how do we get there? That, to me, is a really much more interesting question than how we, how we fix it after it's broken. So I, I would divide that into two different problems. One is when we have things that we know work, how do we get them scaled up? And the second is when we have problems that we're trying to address, how do we figure out what works? So on the first, on scaling up what works, uh, CDC does a lot with state and local governments. And we do a lot with something called the Community Guide, which looks at all of the interventions that have been tried and says, is there sufficient evidence to say that this works? And a lot of times, it will be up to a community to say, all right, from this menu of options that work, we're going to choose this one or this one. We know that in an area like tobacco control, there are very clear guidelines for what works. It's very clear if you do X, you will get Y. And so there, really it's a question of scale up. That's often a question of coalitions. It's often a question of advocacy. It's often a question of political leadership. On the second area, it's more complicated. There are lots of big problems for which we don't have certain solutions. We have good ideas, we have good intentions, we hope they'll work. And there, I think we need more of what I would call practice-based evidence. We talk a lot about evidence-based practice, but we also sometimes have to try things and see if they work, rigorously evaluate them. And if they work, then we can move them into that first category of scale-up. A great example is here in California. You did some of the first Smoke-Free Air Act laws and regulations anywhere in the world. And at that time, it was not so clear that smoke-free laws would save lives and wouldn't hurt business. The, but because it was tried in communities and because it was rigorously evaluated, it then could move into that first category and now it's scaling up and about two-thirds of Americans are covered by smoke-free laws, uh, hundreds of millions of people around the world. We have a lot further to go, but we got there in part because communities were willing to both try something and be brutally honest about whether or not it worked. Mm -hmm. Another hand over here. <clears throat> yeah, hi there. Um, in observing my uh, parents and their, you know, eventually die, and, and I'm observing um, friends and others with health problems, it seems like a big role in health has to do with having a reason to live. And I'm wondering, how is that being addressed? I mean, who's talking about that? That's it a seems nice, simple really question important. for our panel. No, because, <laughs> no, I'm serious. I, I mean, to it, touch that. <clears throat> um, and it's okay if none of you know, but if you know yeah, somebody I could talk to, I'd like to talk to them. Let's try it, panel. I mean, it, it, I don't, as a pediatrician at Cincinnati Children's, I don't uh, deal with people at the end of life, but I do deal with, uh, families and the issues that they confront uh, with um, their health care. And one of, the, one of the things that we're learning is that there is an enormous motivation in the community of people who are confronted with uh, serious illness to get involved and to start to make a difference, not only for themselves, but for each other. Um, they just need a venue in which to make that happen. It's not a large percentage of people. Our hope is to uh, encourage, peop encourage a community of patients to move from a general sense of awareness through uh, 
participation through contribution to a real sense of ownership and over the over the kind of health that they want to have. Um, and uh, what we're starting to see when we make that possible for those conversations to take place is that people do get engaged and that the conversation with physicians completely changes um, and the focus of care completely changes because the issues are not so much uh, driven only from uh, the physician side but there there's much more shared uh, decision making about what's what's taking place other thoughts on this I, I'm reminded dr. Frieden of your comment to me of um, we ought to talk about health not health care well, I think first you have to address mental health issues, which are <coughs> dramatically under-addressed in our healthcare system. Mm -hmm. Depression is under-recognized and under-treated. Um, simple things like increasing physical activity that can have a major impact on outlook on life, on depression, on a whole host of healthcare uh, indicators are not adequately addressed. And I think there are some broader issues that would be good to discuss as society. Often, we have kind of the concept that almost without limit, the longer the life, the better. And when you take care of patients at the end of life and you have someone who can say, I'm at peace now and I'm ready to go, that isn't a failure of medicine. And yet for many of us doctors, we feel like that's a failure of medicine. We're going to give them the mic for I've, one more quick Right. I've, quick I've one. done a, a lot of work with unemployed people. And, and um, in fact, I, I talked to Marty Seligman about it. And he said after war and rape, extended unemployment can be the most uh, serious source of traumatic stress, in, at least in our sort of society. So unemployment is a, is a health issue. It's a mental health issue. Mm -hmm. It's not only a mm -hmm. I don't have insurance issue. It's a my self-esteem has been destroyed and I feel like I've of no value to anybody issue. I'm looking at the clock. Um, one quick qu final question, yes. Uh, we'll uh, I have the microphone here, I, may I ask one question? Uh, if you've got a microphone, yes. I, okay. I, I, <laughs> I win. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so you asked us to introduce ourselves. I, I'm a doctor of internal medicine. Uh, I also have a split personality disorder. I got an MBA and then worked in financial transaction services. It's okay, we forgive you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, trying to combine them both by looking at the ability of technology to reach into people's homes, bring care to them, and do a lot of what was discussed on this panel today. One of the things perhaps was addressed, I came in late, that is preventing this from happening is reimbursements. Mm -hmm. As many of us know, we get paid as doctors to do things to people, not for people. And so I'm, I'm curious to know how a lot of what was discussed on the panel today is going to be enabled by structural payment reform that's occurring already through Obamacare, yeah. but also maybe novel things that you may have seen. Well, aside from an ad for your organization, um, I think, Mike, you wanted to no, was, jump yeah. in? Oh, Car Carol. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, so we started that process um, with the innovations and the experimentation around re new reimbursement strategies and new models of delivery of care. Um, that's just the beginning. I think we have to figure out what works and how to get the details right. And then oftentimes what we see happening is that public payers start the process and then that trickles down to private payers. So I think um, the future looks bright for thinking about new reimbursement strategies. Um, both public and private. Great. Um, in the final countdown, I always like to close on a really simple question, you know, like end world hunger or something like that. <laughs> so here you go, panel. Nice, simple one. Lightning round. We'll start down at this end this time. Um, debunk one myth for us in this space of innovation, cost, uh, economic growth related to healthcare wellness, you name it. Why don't you start at the other end? Ah! <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> the myth is that innovation always has to be high tech. Some of the most powerful innovations are some of the lowest tech. A checklist, a healthcare worker in the community. In fact, that perhaps is one of the most powerful lessons we're learning from around the world. Doctors should be the quarterback. They shouldn't be uh, doing everything on the team. And if you get nurses, nurse practitioners, office managers, outreach workers, doing other things, you can get better quality at lower cost with more employment. Excellent. Jonathan. I think that 
the innovation we're talking about is not intellectually challenging. I think it's politically challenging. I think whether it's the ability to address end of life issues in a politically sensible way, or whether it's discussing how we move people in, move the system into paying for quality as opposed to paying for quantity. Those are political issues. Those are not uh, intellectual issues. Mm -hmm. Good point. Carol? Yeah, I would say that when we think about the Affordable Care Act and we think about the universalization of health insurance, there are costs associated with that, but there can be really important um, economic growth opportunities from that, and in particular, the idea that people aren't necessarily locked into a job. And we know that when people have health insurance from a spouse or after they turn 65, there's more entrepreneurship. So I think the availability and accessibility of health insurance through things like the exchanges can really foster entrepreneurialism uh, and have good economic consequences. Wonderful. Great point, Tom. I think, you know, when I look at it, high tech, you can be high tech, but not necessarily that high a tech. I mean, things like stabilized paper that I can take out in the middle of Africa, that I can do point of care diagnostics with a cell phone over the, over the internet. This is, this, these are great innovations that I see. Mm -hmm. and now okay, I'll take my Dr. Margolis, turn. you've had your so extra minute and a half. My extra minute, um, <laughs> I, I think that uh, the sense of abundance that exists is an incredible source of uh, motivation for people to innovate, uh, even in the context of not ha uh, of uh, declining resources. Wonderful. I would like to thank our audience, and please join me in thanking our great panel. Thank you very much.